Hello, this is Made It Here, where we made it easier for you to learn medicine. We are extremely overjoyed that you liked our videos. And this could not have been possible without your likes, comments and subscriptions. Well, in this part of the lecture, we will be continuing the rest part on general osteology. So if you haven't watched the first part yet, click on the upper right corner. Finish the video and then come back here. Because we don't want you to watch it just for the sake of watching, but we want you to watch it for the sake of learning. In these few coming minutes, we will be dealing on macro and microscopic aspects of the bone under their structural classification. The blood supply and innervation of bones. Under histology, we will be explaining the ground sections of compact and cancellous bones. We also will be highlighting upon the histology of osteon or the basic unit of bone. We will give you a basic idea about the ossification process and its laws. Since the professor are fond of asking about the sesamoid bones, examples and their functions, we will also be talking about the sesamoid bones at the last of the video. Macroscopically, that is when viewing from a naked eye, the architecture of a bone can be either compact or a cancellous arrangement. Talking about the compact bone, it is dense and extremely porous and it is best developed in the cortex of long bones. Cancellous bone is open in texture and is made up of complex network of trabeculae between which are marrow containing spaces. The cancellous bone is a modified adaptation to compressive forces. This means that the bone can withstand the compressive forces by the action of cancellous bone. And the trabecular meshwork seen in the cancellous bone are basically of three types. There can be the meshwork of rods, the meshwork of rods and plates, or either only plates. Now let's talk about the comparison between the compact and cancellous bone. And let's start with the location. The compact bone is seen in the shaft or diaphysis or the main body of the long bone, whereas the cancellous or spongy bone is seen in the epiphysis of long bone. That is, the ends of the long bones. The lamellae or the thin plates of bony tissues in a compact bone are arranged to form the Aversian system. Whereas in a cancellous bone, the lamellae are not arranged into a definitive Aversian system like that of the compact bone. Rather, they are arranged in a random meshwork-like arrangement. The bone marrow in a compact bone is yellow or red depending upon the age group. Before puberty, it is red since it is primarily hematopoietic in function and after the puberty, the bone marrow appears yellow which stores fat. You can remember as, as your age advances or as you become old, you start developing fat in your body, right? Talking about the bone marrow of the cancellous or a spongy bone, it is primarily red and it produces RBCs, WBCs and platelets. The compact bone is hard and ivory-like as I've already told you, whereas the name spongy bone itself suggests that it is spongy in nature. Microscopically, the bone are of five types, namely lamellar, including both compact and cancellous bones, woven bone, fibrous bone, dentin, and cementum. Now let's talk about the lamellar bone. Most of the mature human bones, whether compact or cancellous, are composed of thin plates of bony tissue called as lamellae. The lamellae are arranged in piles in a cancellous bone, but in concentric cylinders called as Haversian system or a secondary osteon in a compact bone. As you can see in the figure I have drawn, these are the cylinders that represent the Haversian system. Now what are the woven bone? The woven bone is seen in fetal bone, in cases of fracture repair and cancers of bone. The fibrous bone is seen in young fetal bones, but remember one thing, they are most common in reptiles and amphibias. Dentin and cementum occur in teeth. Now let's talk about the blood supply of long bone. As I've already told you, bone is a highly vascular tissue with multiple arterial supplies. This is also an important question from general anatomy and you are supposed to draw a diagram in anatomy exams as far as possible. Namely, the arteries supplying the long bone are epiphyseal arteries, metaphyseal arteries. The metaphyseal arteries are found only in young long bones, the periosteal arteries and nutrient artery. Now let's look at the diagram. 
In the diagram, you can see at the topmost part, there is an epiphyseal artery. The epiphyseal artery are found on non-articular bony surface. Now you might be wondering what is a non-articular bony surface. The non-articular bony surface of a bone is the surface of the bone that is not actively involved in joint formation. It means the surface of the bone that does not come in contact with the next bone for the purpose of joint formation. Now let's talk about metaphyseal arteries. The metaphyseal arteries are also called the juxtaepiphyseal artery of Lexer. Remember this name as it is an important question in your vivas and MCQs. Juxta in anatomy means nearby. You have to remember this word as you might encounter this in your life again and again. The metaphyseal arteries pierce the metaphysis along the line of attachment of joint capsule. Now the joint capsule basically is the covering of a joint. Just remember that for now. We'll be talking about joints in our next part of the lectures. The nutrient artery. We have also talked about it in the first part of the video. The nutrient artery enters through the shaft and divides into ascending and descending branches along the medullary cavity. The nutrient artery, the branches of the nutrient artery actually, they terminate by anastomosing with the other arteries in the metaphysis, epiphysis and the periosteum. The nutrient artery as you can see in the figure supplies tooth hole of the cortex and all the medullary cavity or the central portion of the bone. The last one is periosteal artery which divides and supplies the rest of the one third of the periosteum or the outer covering of the bone. Look at the figure very carefully. In this figure, now have a look at this picture. You can see that the metaphyseal arteries are forming hairpin bends like structures at the epiphyseal plate of cartilage or near to the epiphyseal plate of cartilage. You can see that the epiphyseal arteries are dividing into ascending arteries and descending branches at the epiphyseal ends of the bone. Similarly, you can see a tortuous or spiral-like nutrient artery that is entering from the nutrient foramen and supplying the medullary cavity. You can see the pinkish area of bone in the figure. At the lower end of the figure, when you view carefully, you can see the anastomosis between the epiphyseal and metaphyseal arteries. Right? I hope that makes you clear on the blood supply of the long bone. Now let's talk about the direction of nutrient artery. An interesting fact about the nutrient artery is that the foramen through which the nutrient artery enters, also known as the nutrient foramen, are directed opposite to the growing end of the long bone. Now you might be confused what a growing end of a long bone actually is. For now, remember that the growing end of a long bone is the end in which the epiphyseal fusion with the diaphysis occurs at the last or it is the point where the epiphyseal fusion is delayed. Okay? The direction of nutrient foramen are indicated by the rhyme to the elbow I go, from the knee I flee. This means that the nutrient foramina are directed towards the elbow and away from the knee. There is a reason behind such type of arrangement of the nutrient foramina. The reason is that the nutrient artery runs away from the growing end as the growing bone might pull and rupture the artery. Now let me make you clear. There is a bone, right? The bone grows in length and the artery might be pulled as the bone grows in length, right? And it might lead to rupture of the artery. Therefore, the direction of the artery is always opposite to the growing end of the bone due to which the artery can be kept safe anatomically. Okay? Now let's talk a little about the histology of bone. I have kept some images for your ease. First of all, let's look at the three-dimensional view of a bone showing its longitudinal and the transfer section that is made from the diaphysis of a long bone. Imagine that you are holding a long bone vertically. Now you cut the same bone in a horizontal direction called as transfer section and a longitudinal direction called as longitudinal section or a vertical section. Right? So while viewing microscopically, you can see there are numerous circular like structures, right? Called as osteons. And you can appreciate this very well in a transverse section, right? 
so now look at the longitudinal section i've made right here you can clearly appreciate that the osteons are cylindrical in shape you can see that the haversian canal has a no, okay for now just let just remember that there is a canal like structure through which a red colored structure is passing by right the red colored structures are the blood vessels so there are the canal through which the blood vessel is passing is called a haversian canal but there is not only a blood vessel there are other structures passing through the haversian canal too which i'll be talking about in the later part of the video right so you can also appreciate uh, horizontal or oblique type of canals in the same picture now let's look at a uh, next picture that is the schematic diagram of the same three dimensional picture in which you can clearly see the circular type of structures called as osteon so what is an osteon an osteon is the basic unit of bone remember this thing and the osteon are found between the outer and the inner circumferential systems of compact bone now look at the picture very carefully you can see at the outermost part of the picture there is an outer circumferential lamellae and at the innermost part of the picture you can see inner circumferential lamellae okay look at the picture i have pointed it out and between those lamellae there are circular structures called as osteon right so let's talk about the structure of an osteon they are long cylindrical and they are branched okay and each osteon contains 4 to 20 concentric lamellae now what is an what is something that is concentric concentric means circular right so due to the presence of the 4 to 20 concentric lamellae the osteons appear to be circular okay and uh, if you look at the if you take a, an individual osteon and have a look at the central part of the osteon, you can see a next small circle, right? The small circle, uh, just imagine that there is a cylinder and if you cut the cylinder, then the central portion that is circular also appears cylindrical, right? If, even if it, it is cut. I hope I made you clear, but it is all about imagination and however the s small circle at the center which i have told you that is that proceeds downward inside in the form of a canal the canal's name is haversian canal right and the haversian canal is lined by endosteum and has osteoprogenitor cells now i hope you guys remember what an osteoprogenitor cell is it is an osteo means bone and progenitor means something having totipotent capability or something that has the capacity to produce something right so osteoprogenitor cells are the cells that are able to synthesize osteoblast cells okay that are able to convert into osteoblast cells and the osteoblast cells are the bone forming cells okay they are the bone cells that synthesize the bone matrix and what is the name of the bone matrix the name of the bone matrix is osteoid okay I hope you guys remember this now i had mentioned earlier i hope you guys remember that the haversian canal has blood vessels okay and in addition to blood vessels it also has nerves lymphatics and loose connective tissue this is a very important question for bds students that what is the content of haversian canal and most of the students are found to answer only blood vessels which is entirely wrong so you have to answer that the content of haversian canal are blood vessels nerves lymphatics and the loose connective tissue okay and i had mentioned earlier there are uh, some horizontal or oblique type of canals whose names are workman's canal okay i hope you guys remember so if you look at the picture very carefully you can see a uh, horizontal type of canals okay that are seem to connect the haversian canals so what is the function of volkman's canal the volkman's canal connect the haversian canals to each other okay now this is the same picture but in a magnified way and if you pick it pick an ostean up okay for example I'm picking an ostean up and magnifying it in a high power resolution. Then what I can appreciate is that there are, okay, look at the picture very carefully. There are dark or black colored structures, okay? Those are the lacuna. Lacuna are nothing but the hollow spaces in which the osteocytes or 
what are osteocytes they are the mature bone cells right so in an osteon there are lacuna and within the lacuna there are osteocytes so let me tell you a next thing that osteocytes contain cytoplasmic processes or cell processes and the cell processes are housed within the canaliculi look at the picture you can see uh, finger like projections that are radiating from the dark colored structure also known as lac lacuna uh, those are the canaliculi okay so at the lower part of the osteon you can see aversian canal containing blood vessel okay now we take a compact bone grind it okay grind the compact bone and convert it into a powder form now imagine everything that i'm telling you all right you take a compact bone or a long bone okay and you grind the diaphysis part since the compact bone is primarily found in the diaphysis of the long bone so i cut a long bone from its diaphysis crush the diaphysis of the long bone and convert it into a powder form now i place the powder form in a glass slide and view it microscopically by passing light through it what i can appreciate is that i can appreciate numerous osteons since the compact bone is primarily made up of osteons right which are also called the lamellae of compact bone this is called the transverse section of compact bone and what kind of section dry section why i am focusing on this part is that the uh, external teachers are very fond of asking basic question that what is a ground section what is a dry section so it's the same thing okay either you call it a ground section or a dry section so when you see a dry section made transversely of a compact bone you can appreciate there are centrally aversion canals and surrounding hollow spaces called as lacuna as a whole the structure is known as osteon okay so this is also the same figure and i've placed a schematic diagram of the transverse section of compact bone or a dry section in which you can see that there are volkmann's canal they are connecting the two aversion canals okay you can see in the picture um this is also the same picture mm, this is also the same picture the longitudinal section of a compact bone uh, so um, in this longitudinal section you can very well appreciate the volkmann's canal i hope you are clear on this just imagine that the bone is cut in a vertical way okay so when the bone is cut in a vertical way you can clearly appreciate the volkmann's canal okay and also the aversion canals that are connected by the volkmann's canal now let's talk about the section of cancellous bone i hope you guys remember what a cancellous bone exactly is cancellous bone primarily comprises of the meshwork of trabeculae of the woven bone or the bone is composed of network like arrangement rather than a definitive circular aversion systems or osteon right so now let's talk about the histology of cancellous bone the histology of cancellous bone shows the meshwork of trabecular bone as i've already told you and inside the trabeculae okay look at the picture very carefully there are dark pink areas okay those those areas are those areas are very homogeneous as you can see in the picture so these homogeneous areas so what are the content of this homogeneous areas or the trabeculae so inside the trabeculae are osteocytes okay or the mature bone cells that are entrapped within the lacuna okay and in between the trabeculae okay just for example you can see here is a here is a trabeculae and here is a next trabeculae that are connected and in between them you can see the dotted or whitish kind of areas right so in between the trabeculae of woven bone there is a presence of marrow space so this space is called the marrow space as you can see there are hollow spaces Uh, those are not actually hollow but they are due to the seam hollow due to the presence of adipocytes or the fat cells remember this thing that the adipocytes or the fat cells okay the name fat cells itself suggests so what can you imagine its cytoplasm as 
obviously it has fat right so the fat cells they do not take the stain or the hematoxylin and eosin stain remember the name it is also called as h and e stain as you can see in the picture it is pinkish type of stain okay so the fat cells do not take any stain and they appear whitish areas okay so the marrow space is filled with blood cells this pinkish dot 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 type of areas those are those are nothing but the blood cells and the cancellous bones especially i had told you in the earlier slides too the marrow space major it seems red due to hematopoietic function and the content of marrow spaces are rbcs wbcs and platelets okay i hope i made you clear on this so you can see at the next picture this is this seems to be like a handmade diagram that is uh, that i've kept for your ease it is the same type of figure in which you can see numerous bony trabeculi in which the osteocytes are entrapped within the lacuna and the bone marrow is pinkish in color you can see the rbcs and um, you can also say, see the fat cells okay now a lamellar bone including both compact and cancellous bone is primarily composed of lamellae so what is a lamellae it is nothing but a thin plate of bony tissue that are arranged in piles or circular form called as haversian system okay so now let's talk about the three types of lamellae the three types of lamellae that are found in the bone is either circumferential lamellae or an osteonic lamellae or an interstitial lamellae okay in circumferential lamellae the lamellae are found parallel to the bone surface it means that the lamellae are arranged in piles like form okay and it is major it is seen in cancellous bone as i've already told you just remember one thing that when you come across the word compact bone you have to remember osteons okay so what kind of lamellae you can expect in a compact bone obviously osteonic lamellae okay and the osteonic lamellae are concentric and is found near the vascular canals of bone or the haversian canals of bone okay and the interstitial as the name itself suggests what is an interstitium it is the space between two things okay it is basically it is a space so interstitial lamella is found between the osteons okay i hope i made you clear again now let's talk about the two basic type of lamellae the pressure lamellae and the tension lamellae when you look at the picture carefully the direction of the arrangement of pressure lamellae and the tension lamellae are somewhat perpendicular to each other okay look at the diagram the pressure lamellae are arranged such that the bone is capable of resisting compressive forces as you can see in the picture pressure is applied at the upper end of bone you can see there is an arrow at the upper end of the bone which denotes pressure applied on the bone okay so remember pressure lamella resist pressure okay and provides support to the bone the tension lamellae primarily resist bending or torquing forces applied especially at the constricted region or the neck of the bone what is the neck actually okay basic concept i want to give it to you neck imagine a human body the smallest or the narrowest part is the neck right so in the same way in the bone the neck of the bone is the most constricted region of the bone the example of this type of lamellae is calcar femoral calcar femoral is a ridge like modification that is seen in femur bone or the bone found in thigh and its role is stress bearing and redistribution of the stress such that the bone does not easily fracture under application of stresses now let's talk about wolf's law according to wolf's law bone formation is directly proportional to the stress and strain in simpler words mechanical stresses highly affect the process of bone formation this means that when the bone is subjected to tensile and compressive forces bone formation is highly enhanced okay that's all for today we'll shortly be uploading our next video on remaining topics that are ossification of bone its law bone remodeling and sesamoid bones 
As a matter of fact, you might feel that you learned a lot while watching the video, but let me tell you, the YouTube videos are quite volatile. And this doesn't imply only to YouTube videos but to books as well. So reading once is never sufficient and you need to keep revising the topic time and again. You might also be thinking why we didn't upload videos on other topics or other subjects. But we don't want you guys to get fed up or get bored with too many information at a time. So we decided to make videos timely, short and contented. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.